Hey friends, it's Nikki Lerner. How are you today? I'm so glad that you decided to join me for this episode of the Culture Coach podcast. Today, I'm excited to share an interview that I did with my good friend and mentor, Dr. Paul Rarden from Temple University. We got into some really interesting conversation around music, creativity, community and how when you are involved in a community that is culturally diverse or trying to become culturally diverse, uh, you really have to wrestle with being selfless and selfish and deal with those things in the same space. We talked about how uh, choirs and music give people who have otherwise felt a sense of othered, uh, a sense of belonging and family. And we also talked about Uh, what Dr. Raritan sees right now in the college space with regards to cultural diversity, particularly in creativity, and also what he has a vision for, for uh, college work and college life in the area of cultural diversity. I am so excited for you to hear this. Enjoy. So today on the podcast, I am joined by one of my favorite people on the planet, And I'm not just saying that because you happen to be on this podcast. Uh, My favorite people on the podcast, um, Dr. Paul Reardon, who has been um, just uh, one of the most influential people in my life uh, for so many reasons. I learned more from you. I think I told you this once. I learned more from you when I was in college, just watching you do what you do than I ever learned um, in like learning information, you know, mm-hmm. or words or whatever. So, um, so much of who I am as an artist uh, is re- is reflected in who you are uh, as a teacher. That and, means uh, so much to me, Nikki. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, j- I'm just honored to be here. And, and oh, the influence works both ways. You know, I've wow. learned a lot from you, and I've been. I'm so pleased that we've stayed in touch over, you yeah. know, over you know two decades. That's I know, really right? Cool. Well, thanks yeah. for that. So today, um, Paul, I just wanted to connect with you because you uh, have just, you, I think you lead a lovely, flowing, diverse lifestyle for as long as I've known you. And not only just in your lifestyle, but also in your work and as a creative, as a musician, as a conductor, um, I've, I have never met someone who has been quite as intentional as you have been in your work to include and make room for as many people as possible. So today I'm really gonna poke around, um, what have you been learning and what can you share as a passionate leader of uh, diverse music, diverse musicians and diverse repertoire um, over your life. So let me stop talking and uh, can you just introduce yourself however you would like to, to our listeners. Well, thank you, and hello to your listeners, and um, I know why you tune in, because you get you get the same sort of charge in your batteries from talking to Nikki, from listening to her sing or listening to her speak, and uh, I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you today. I teach, I, I have been teaching choral music for almost 30 years, and uh, Nikki and I, as uh, uh, our time together began when I was teaching at Towson University, just north of Baltimore, and had 12 wonderful years there. And then I went off to the University of Michigan to teach six more years. And now I'm finishing my ninth year at Temple University. Philadelphia is my hometown. So th- uh, coming to Temple has been a sort of homecoming of sorts for me, which has been wonderful in many ways. Um, I was a composer before I was a conductor. And the reason I'm a conductor now is because I was a bad enough composer that I realized I needed to do something else. But more importantly, and this is a big part of my journey as as a choral artist, when I had the epiphany in graduate school, because composition was what I went into in graduate school. That's what I did well enough to be able to get into graduate school. But I had an idea in my mind that conducting might be more suited for me. So when I would try to write music, I was on a schedule because like we were saying before we went on air that the, um, that I'm a creature of routine. So nine o'clock in the morning, that's when I go to my library, Carol, this, I write my music from nine to 1030 and then I'm done and I stop. And if I, I started measure one and if I don't get past measure three or four, 
that's all I do. I didn't, I, it was a long process for me and it was a lonely process. And when I realized it was a lonely process and that I got the opposite feeling from being in choirs, mm. that's when I had my epiphany. I thought, I, why, am, why is this composition not working for me because I'm not with other people? That was my sort of sign from God that I, I need to, I had a sense I might need, want to go into conducting, but when I realized why it was that I wanted to go into conducting, that of, of course there's, there's certain things about conducting we like in terms of being able to influence, being able to control, I won't deny any of that. But the fact is you're with people, you're getting instant feedback, you're hearing sound, you're hearing beauty, all the time. When I had that realization, that's when I thought, okay, conducting is what I need to do. And I've been doing it for almost 30 years since and loving it. So there's my intro. Wow. Oh my goodness. So in, in all these years that we've known each other, um, I've never asked you about that. Um, that, that literally just blew my mind because what you're talking about is how just music and creativity, that how it thrives in community, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. I mean, certainly sit in our rooms by ourselves and write a song, right? But That's until right. it's shared. Um, and gosh, even, really even, the com- even more sex- successful composers who are able to uh, crank out music more quickly because the social joy I got from composing was when I would conduct my own pieces. Mm. But it, the stretch between when I start a piece and when I stand up to conduct it was too long to to have that feeling with any sort of regularity. And with conducting, it's happening all the time. So yeah, there is no question that the um, the joy that one gets, the sort of selflessness that as a member of a choir, I am joining my voice to all of these 50 or 20 or 100 voices. And our job is to put us, it's, it's sort of two opposite things, Nikki. It's number one, to be selfless. I am part of a group and I need to adapt to the sound that is best for this piece, for this choir. But at the same time, I'm an individual and I want my voice to be heard. And that's part of the, an, another part of the journey that's been um, fascinating for me is how do I achieve that as a conductor, how do I both let every single of my 36 members of my concert choir know that I know their names, that I know enough about them to know what makes them tick, and yet at the same time, how do I get them to believe that there, there are times when we need to create sounds that might not be exactly what you're learning in your lessons? If we do it right, we have so many different kinds of music that, uh, uh, that they're exploring in the best sense, the different sounds that the voice can make. So on the one hand, being selfish and letting your voice be heard, and number on the other hand, being selfless and being part of the community. Finding that balance, I think, is one of the uh, one of the real challenges, but also real joys of what I do. And I think that the, when I'm on when I'm on my game. Yeah. Really on my game. And, and I'm glad that you've been able to observe a couple of rehearsals and, and see this take place. Um, to know that sometimes the best thing you can do musically in a rehearsal is to do no music and to just talk yeah. and to hear what the students are thinking and how they're feeling. Uh, because when I give them agency to speak up and when I've created a space where people com- feel comfortable raising their hands and uh, asking questions or even being critical sometimes, mm. That's when they uh, that's when they flip a switch from being just um, a, a docile yes sir just tell me what to do and I'll do it to a uh, a fully formed fully full fledged member of the ensemble that has mm-hmm. whose voice is important to what we do. Um, I've been hearing great teachers say that for years since I began teaching, but it hasn't really been to the last five or ten that I've made it more a part of my pedagogy. To, to have that 10 minute freeze in rehearsal when we're not doing music. And number one, my students are getting to rest their voices and that's very important. Two hours is a long time to sing. Mm. But number two, uh, I'm, I'm finding out more about them as people. I'm finding what their issues are, what their concerns are. I'm, and I learn so much from them that it's, uh, 
I, I sort of think, okay, can I go back to 1993 when I started and take what I know now and just right. just hit reset on the yeah. on the old career and see what happens? Yeah, man, see, just brilliant. Because <laughs> I, I feel like, I feel like you have just described what it's like, um, and not only what it's like, but the posture that a person needs to develop and to practice in order to live a multicultural existence. Mm. I mean, you, you have just described all of it using the context of what it's like to be a part of a choir. Um, it's probably why I love choirs so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, in, in my, so in my context, um, in the, the role that I was previously in, um, led a choir that was about a hundred people on a good day, um, multicultural kind of choir. And when I took that position, I would call and reach out to people in other places and say, hey, tell me what you're doing with your choir. And people would start to say that they were getting rid of choirs because choirs weren't cool. Mm. And so they would have a choir that had been in existence for several years. And just because they decided that choirs weren't cool, whoever, I don't know who made that up, but the choirs weren't cool anymore, or that, you know, songwriters weren't writing for choirs anymore, which is ridiculous, right? It's not true. <laughs> um, that they should just get rid of theirs. And so they would essentially fire a whole group of people who were volunteers, by the way, mm. um, and just tell them there's no room for you anymore. Um, and then go to sort of a model that kind of uplifted the one mm. or just the three. You know, here are the people that are uber talented, super sexy, and the ones that we could sell, you know, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> all of those things. And I love you know what you're saying about a choir. There's just something about a choir that is unlike anything else that you could ever create. You know, Robert Shaw, one of the greats in our profession said, and he, he was known for not necessarily having a, an especially beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. And he acknowledged that, but they, he said, but even my voice is better than no voice. And I found that a beautiful encouragement to those people who may like him feel like they don't necessarily have a beautiful voice. Yeah. Um, but know that their, their gifts are wanted and needed and that we can get more from just this musical endeavor than just musical satisfaction that it, it extends much deeper. We have the blessing in vocal music of needing words. Yeah. Our instrumentalist friends can still get much musical joy and they can still know that the music they're playing is about something or has a certain meaning, but to actually physically sing words gives us an avenue to explore the whole range of human emotion mm. through the co course of a choral concert or even a single piece. And that helps students connect to their lives. They are, you know, it's very interesting. One of the, one of the more common reasons I, I hear from students that they need to miss a rehearsal is that a grandparent has passed away. They're in that time in their college mm -hmm. years when their grandparents are passing away. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and sometimes, of course, it's, it's closer family than that, unfortunately, or, or dear friends even. But um, sometimes a, a singing can be the best way to do that grieving or to help the grieving process move along. Mm -hmm. um, and on, on the flip side, to experience great joy and happiness together. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a straight line from choral music to those emotions for the, w when you feel completely at home in the, in the rehearsal setting. Yeah, man, that's, that's just deep. Oh, it's deep. I, I tell my singers a lot of times that, you know, singing is not about tones, right? It's about communication. Mm -hmm. Like who cares if you can sing some tones, big, big deal. Like we can get tones on a recording. That's right. But what we can't get in the live experience um, from a particular group of people or a soloist or a choir is the unique uh, perspective that is happening and being created in that moment from the lives of those people communicating that work to whoever is listening. Right, you are. And that is the beauty of, of performance mm -hmm. and what we're able to do and share with people. 
um, which is pretty awesome. Man, that's great. Oh, we need to do a whole separate podcast on choir. <laughs> Sweet it Lord. Do it. We're going to do it. Uh, you should be hosting this podcast with me every single week. I'm just saying. No way. No way. Throw that out there. <laughs> so let me, <laughs> excuse me, let me ask you a couple of things related to culture. So mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about what it was like for you growing up? Mm -hmm. um, what was your life like? Was it uh, was it diverse? Was it not? What are like a an ex what's an experience or two that have shaped you to be the person you are uh, today? You know, I um, when I started uh, the first years of my life were uh, in a part of Philadelphia called Germantown, and then we moved to another part called West Oak Lane, um, which I would think is probably considered middle class, perhaps middle to lower class. Uh, my father was a pastor at a Methodist church in uh, West Oak Lane, and the neighborhood I lived in was I was majority African American, and I in fact was the only white child in my kindergarten class. So even though I I'm not sure how much of a lens I had at that time for the fact that I looked different, I don't remember thinking, "Oh my gosh, I look different," but I must have, <laughs> and. Um, and it was only for that year, the year after that, uh, I, uh, my brothers and I went to a private school that fortunately was very diverse and very progressive and uh, was able to experience lots of wonderful things. But I remember certainly having the feeling of otherness as uh, at a young age. And I don't know if it's that necessarily, but I have always been, I've always had radar out for the person who feels left out and one of the things I've come to appreciate over the course of my career is that everybody in my choir room has some reason or other way they, that, that they might feel left out. Mm -hmm. And they might not all be visible to the naked eye, but everyone, we all have our stuff, right? And uh, so part of my job as a conductor is to make sure that everybody is welcome and everyone knows they feel welcome. And we can talk about some of the ways to do that. So that was a, a strong memory that I have from my kindergarten years. Uh, the school that I went to um, was a Quaker school, and I was there from first grade until 12th grade. And uh, the philosophy of the Quaker religion is based in equality. And the, the worship service is a meeting for worship, and it is, in, it is conducted in silence. There is no celebrant. There is no pastor. Uh, anyone who wishes to can stand and speak and speak about whatever they wish. So we would have some 40-minute meetings for worship where nobody would speak and some where one or two would speak and sometimes it was students sometimes it was faculty um but we learned that uh that everybody was equal in that respect the the school was very progressive i think we'd have to say in, in many respects very liberal although it was there there were certainly classmates of mine who i who i think did not identify that way and that made for a wonderful debate and that's one of the things I need to remember in my own journey now is that however my, I may identify politically, we, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And if I don't leave part of my heart open for somebody with whom I do not agree, we're all in trouble. So, um, so going to that school, uh, the, the Quaker school that I went to for, um, from first grade all the way through 12th, really it, it did many things. I, I think it was probably more racially and, and internationally diverse than most public schools are. I, I, I can't cite figures, but that was the sense that I got. So we were constantly um, uh, reading and singing things outside of the main, the Western European canon. Mm. So that is, it, it, it was in, uh, it was at Germantown Friends School in Philadelphia that I learned and first got a taste of uh, African-American spirituals, for example, and I never let go um, yeah. because I just, uh, they, there is a certain universality to them. And one of, the, one of the ways I realized they were universal is when I had the opportunity in my 12th grade year to go to what was then the Soviet Union and what is now oh, of course, wow. Russia um, to perform. And we performed Russian music, we performed American music, we would always end with spirituals and the applause was sustained and it would switch from being just sort of general applause to rhythmic, rhythmic applause. Wow. But my God, 
<laughs> what is it about this music that resonates so deeply, not all, with all of us singing and with our conductor who programmed it, but also with these people who were, you know, thousands of miles away and m probably did not have much exposure to any of that. What is resonating with them? Um, so I, I, I was very fortunate from, for most of my formative years to be surrounded by people who did not look like me necessarily and to be uh, offered many different viewpoints of things to learn how uh, to be accepting in that sort of in that sort of world there's no question this is a it, it, it was an affluent school but it's a school that made a decision to stay in the part of the city in the part of germantown that it remains today when other schools were sort of fleeing for the suburbs it made a point of saying if this is part of our mission is is diversity then we're going to stay here and and make that make that work for us. Um, so those are some of the things that I remember that 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 um, may have started started me thinking um, that choir needs to be a place that people feel home mm. in. And that they're always there's always going to be a reason that anybody in the room has where whether it's their religion, whether it's their race, whether it's their uh, ethnicity nationality, uh, sexual preference, uh, gender identity, mm -hmm. uh, re uh, politics, there's always going to be a reason that's that somebody feels other. Yeah. And uh, I need to do what I can as a conductor to to let uh, find ways that unite us that bring us together. So unfortunately, I mean, that's that's built into my job description, I'm always going to have diverse people around me singing and so then it's just a question of what i do with it and how i pass along what i what i feel is important to them yeah you <laughs> you are doing a very pastoral work oh wow i love that i don't know if you've ever thought about that i've never thought about that until right this moment um, i love that image i love that image i've never thought of it even though i have two pastors in my family my brother and my and my dad you're right you're right. And that's why I'm thinking like, it's interesting to me because I, you know, I, I know that you've got ministers in your family that, um, you know, even though you don't like, you know, you're not a pastor of a church or something like that, but that the, the core elements and the most beautiful elements of what would be called pastoral work has flowed into you mm -hmm. as a choir conductor, which I, I just find that fascinating. <laughs> so fascinating, which is why I know even in my experience, um, having the privilege of sitting under your leadership was, I think, I think that's what so drew me to your leadership style, um, was just the fact that I always felt like you saw people you know, and that the time together was about people more than it was about just the repertoire, while at the same time, um, so appreciating the high level and high honor and value and skill that you placed on the work that we were doing within the context of music and choir. I, I love that, um, you know, I didn't have a, well, I loved my music teacher in high school. When I got to college, it was like completely eye-opening for me, the level of skill from musicians that were my professors. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I'd ever sat in a choir where I watched a conductor or a leader love the repertoire so much, like love the text and love the, ah, you know, like there was no throwaway anything. Um, and what, what a beautiful way to honor music and work and creativity and to place a high value. It really, like, really lifted up what we were doing together as a group. I'm really glad to hear you say that, Nikki. And I think you've, you've, hit on something that is part of what what unifies us in a choral setting and that is the appreciation for excellence yeah. every choir in the world wants to improve choirs know if they're coasting choirs know mm -hmm. if they're um if they're not being challenged in the way they could be mm -hmm. choirs sometimes want to hear hey that's not good enough so even though i 
I was, I've always been influenced by my teachers who were very, tended to be very nurturing types. And I'll, I remember vividly one of my mentors in graduate school saying, consider the difference if you're on the podium between that was too loud and that could be softer. Mm. One is a scold, the other is an invitation. The language, yeah. The language, and I've realized that that could be a difference between a singer sort of opening up their heart to try a new way and a better way versus sort of shutting down and thinking, I made a mistake. Mm. But I will say that there are limits to that. Mm. And that even, the, I, I liken it to shouting at one's child if they're about to cross a street that they shouldn't mm. without, without holding the hand. At some point, a choir needs tough love. And I can be encouraging and positive, but if we've plateaued or if they haven't met the level I, we were at last week or two weeks ago, I need to drop the hammer. And <laughs> guess what? They're probably going to yes. appreciate it and think, and they're probably thinking, yep, we deserve that. <laughs> and I'll tell you, that next rehearsal oh, is dude. flammable. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. I, you know, I, I remember moments like that um, in my college years with you where there were moments where you could tell and we knew as a group like we blew it like we so blew it I, I actually think there was one time I think you may have even like um ended rehearsal early because it was kind of like there's no reason to rehearse this music because y'all don't know what you're doing <laughs> right like you, you didn't say it like that but that's what we knew you were saying yeah yep. right and I even employed that technique <laughs> with my choirs because you know, 99% of the time you're gonna get this, right? Like, yeah. okay, that, you know, that could be better or how about we try it like this or whatever. But by the fifth time I've asked you to write something down, yep. right? After you haven't written it down, I'm like, so we're not gonna do this song this week because it's, it's not great. And we're not even gonna honor the songwriter. We're not gonna honor the soloist and working and y'all can be better than this. Yeah, and I remember my people would tell me, they were like, ooh, they were like, when you get to that point, we know like, ooh, and they would start to have sectionals on their own. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because they were like, next time we come to rehearsal, we are gonna nail this song, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but it but it works to the point where to say, hey, if it's not if it's not good enough, it's not it's not good enough. Like you can you can be better. You know, it's and you know, you we're you know, we're always talking about culture and cultural diversity and I, it's one thing I've realized is that great conducting and great teaching is not monolithic. People can have very different styles in how they do it. I had a, I had a choir director, an undergraduate who was tough and who was a taskmaster and once got so upset in his rehearsal, he took the full score of the piece and ripped it in half. And I thought, what? oh my God, what did he just do? And at first I thought, okay, that was a little dramatic. But then I thought later, this man was passionate enough about this music, and we were not rising to the level that he expected mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. And I had immense respect for that. So people teach in different ways. And I don't mean to knock people who, who may lead with uh, negativity, as long as it's balanced with enough. Mm. If, if there's going to be stick, there needs to be carrots somewhere. Yeah, So. Definitely. So let me ask you this about your context. Um, at Temple and just over the years as you've, as you've been in other places. So I, I'll ask you two questions and then you can kind of answer it however you want. The first question is, what do you see as sort of the current state even of, of college creative work? How is it doing with regards to cultural diversity? Mm. And what what would you like to see happen uh, with regards to include you know just including and honoring uh, culture? So what do you see, and and what do you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's oh, the question. Those are fantastic questions, and what I see where I am is. Um, First of all, I think the support for the arts and music and dance in the universities is not going away. Mm -hmm. I, I think even this, in this in this COVID-19 era that we are now <laughs> sadly starting, 
I think there will be some tough decisions administrators have to make and, and cuts that will need to be made across the board, but there is too much demand. There's too much in the, in the mission of universities. There's too much at stake to stop doing those things that bring people joy. Mm. So uh, as far as that goes, interestingly, I think in the arts, one thing I'm seeing is that we hold, there are two different hurdles that someone in the arts needs to clear before they can come to a conservatory or a music program of any kind. They need to clear the hurdle to get into the university. You need to have the certain GPA, the certain test scores. And of course, it's been wonderful to see many schools, including Temple, make the SAT scores optional because they recognize that is that is one kind of learning, that is one kind of assessment that really leaves a lot of people out. Mm. So I think that's a very positive step. Then there is another hurdle to clear and that is uh, that is the audition for, in my, in my case, of a voice program. So we have students who come to us for music therapy, for music education, for music studies, and um, mostly for music performance. Um, that system tends to favor people who can read music, mm. period. Mm. And so that, uh, if the diversity that I see is not, uh, I, and I will just speak very honestly, racially, the racial diversity I see is not where I would like it to be in, uh, in, in my program and in many programs. This is not unique to where I teach and I've, I've, I've seen it everywhere. Um, but there's a sort of double high hurdle that we set for people to come to our program and for students of limited means or underrepresented students to have both of those things, to have mm. fortunate enough to have an education that's gonna get them the grades that they need and, and to get them the experience with what is usually Western European music I mean, that's the note, note system, the, the sight singing system we teach is based on that. Um, that's two pretty high hurdles. So I'm afraid we haven't yet found a way, and that this is probably a decades long process to rethink what it means to be a successful musician at the high school mm. level. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there ways that we can re recognize creativity and talent, not just in singing, but in composition, uh, are, are, do we expect all of our composers to be composing for Western, you know, the, the orchestra, instruments of the orchestra? Or would we, would we be more accepting of students who, uh, who do more with improvisation, do with more with oral tradition? Yeah. Learning? Can I, let me just Please. pause there for a minute because that is, that is so eye-opening to me about, about the reading music. Um, but also, I'm I'm wondering about two two additional things. Yeah. Repertoire and representation. Yes. So I know for me, when I moved from high school to my first college year, um, and I wanted to be a, a vocal major, right? And I was a vocal major, and when I had my first voice lesson, and all of it was opera. Honestly, mm -hmm. I had never, ever, heard, experienced a classical song, an opera. I thought I was gonna go in there and be a pop star. <laughs> right? That's about how much I knew. Cause that's all I had ever been exposed to. I had never been exposed to opera music like at all. So for someone like me, and I had a very diverse upbringing, it was culture shock Yeah, absolutely. for me when I got to school, knowing that that was what the rest of my study would have been and, you know, at that point there weren't like robust vocal jazz programs and stuff like that which i probably would have done but the idea that um someone would would come to a school or even come to an audition and know that this is the only kind of repertoire that might be considered legit um and also that when they look on the who's going to be teaching me mm -hmm. that the l potential lack of representation in professors, which I hear around the country, which is also related to how much study someone has had, right? That's a cultural thing as well. Which goes back to, oh, the, yeah. I, yeah, even in high school. You're, ab you're absolutely right with everything you just said. And I think it speaks to um, 
uh, uh, let's just call it what it is, a bias that we've had for many years in the academy, in the conservatories. And I am, uh, I am a <laughs> proponent of the Western European music. Sure. I, I can't live without it. Yeah. But I, we're a little bit more fortunate on the choral side because so much more music has been published mm. uh, by African Americans, by women, by uh, LGBT composers, LGBTQ composers. Um, that I think it's a little bit easier for us to incorporate that in what we do. Uh, I think the, the voice and opera area is a little bit more challenged in that respect. I think mm -hmm. we have a combination of, I'm, I'm lucky to work with people who recognize what you're talking about as critically important and that well-rounded artists are going to have more than just the Western European canon. What we haven't yet done is to get that into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. How do we practice what we preach as far as that is concerned? Um, Mm. And that's, that's been, that's a real challenge because a voice teacher will tell you that four years to work with an undergraduate student isn't nearly enough <laughs> as what they'd like to, to be able to get someone from point A to point B or C. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we, that's, that's something that we've, I will, I will say, I think we've got miles to go on that before we sleep because that is a re, that is a major challenge. And I think we're, I'm, I'm on the choral side of things for graduate conductors, we have just taken an important step at Temple and that is to shrink what had been a four semester sequence of Western European music into three semesters so that we could add a new course called uh, Choral Music in the Global Community. And we are super proud of that. And my colleague, Mitu Sandaya Hart at Temple will be teaching it next year. And I want to take it because I'm, I'm so excited about it. But for the first time, we will be representing in a curricular way. That is to say, when, you, when a student wants to look at the master's degree at Temple uh, in choral conducting, they will see this class. And we are finally making the statement that, listen, we've been performing this music for years. Great arrangements of spirituals, of folk songs from all over the planet have been proliferating for 20 years, 30 years. And now we're finally sort of validating that into a curriculum which is probably something we could have and maybe should have done long ago. Mm. I think those, uh, those opportunities for, um, for solo voice don't, aren't yet as, as fully formed. And indeed, the kinds of teaching that we have tended to value are very much in the operatic and oratorio and classical tradition. And I think that that needs a look because I think it would be, make a very strong statement to to uh, include a full-time faculty member in our degree programs whose focus is not the Western European canon. And I don't know what it would be necessarily. It might be, uh, it might be tube and throat singing. It might be um, overtone singing, it, but it, might, it would make a statement that we recognize that there's more to this thing we do called singing than just the operatic tradition. That's, oh, gosh. I swear we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> I'm so intrigued by all of this because um, one of the podcasts I just did uh, recently was about the idea of normalizing and how, you know, a lot of times the fear around people talking about uh, culture as it relates to ethnicity is, well, if we talk about it too much or we highlight it too much, doesn't that actually do the opposite? right? So instead of making people feel like they're kind of normal, whatever, it actually highlights the difference and therefore we shouldn't talk about it, which actually that doesn't happen at all. The other actually happens, which is the more inclusive that we are in every part of our context where we find it, that is actually when we don't have to keep talking about it so <laughs> much because it has become normalized. I, I share in my coachings a lot that, you know, particularly for, in our country anyway, for a lot of uh, majority white Americans, that um, their culture is uh, a required course for people who are non-white. Mm. For non-white Americans, um, our cultures are an elective <laughs> or majority culture, right? And I don't even say that as a judgment. I just, it just is, is what it is, right? That is what it is. And it's like that with any kind of majority culture, yeah. right? Like if no matter, I and mean, we're all majority culture at some point, 
in some instance, right? We find ourselves in, but when it comes to race that way, that's what it is. So what happens is, is that the dominant culture, majority culture, all of the systems and the, you know, the expressions and all that is called normal. Mm-hmm, 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 right. Every other expression is either called other or ethnic or these kinds of things and further keeps it apart from what is normal. And so when I'm hearing you talking about, you know, having teachers who can teach global singing or um, a, a different kind, like I have a lot of people that I've worked with, a lot of white people that I've worked with that say, I want to know how to sing in an African-American tradition. I yes. love the way right. that sounds. Can yes. you teach me how to do that? Yes. Right. But if you had this beautiful diversity of teachers uh, at colleges everywhere that could teach different types of cultural singing, I mean, my goodness, how beautiful would that be? And how important it would be to normalize the musical come from from so many different cultures you know i i loved all of that and my, what i thought of when you talked about normalizing is we'll know we've made it when i or one of my choral colleagues can program a whole program of music by african-american composers and not call it music by african-american yeah. composers exactly. just, <laughs> just wow. say this is a Temple University concert choir. Here's our concert. What did yeah. you think? Can you imagine like the next Temple University concert choir being, you know, come, come hear us sing. We're, this is, this is a night of white composers. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All male. <laughs> right. All male, white male composers. Like, mm, I'm not sure I'm going to go to that. That's you know? exactly but right. But that's essentially what it is. Right. And it's like some composers get to just be people. Right. Other composers have to, have some sort of label on them before that happens and so i think you're right even in what you see coming right that that these things are just normal at some point like of course you would go to a college uh performance and hear songs from all over the world and in different kinds of neighborhoods in the united states and you know like of course you would hear that because that is who we are now you know it, one uh, one thing I've learned, and an area that I have to confess a bit of a blind spot in terms of diversity, is religious diversity. And I have tended to view my programming largely from the lens in of making sure that not all of it's sacred and not all of it's secular. But within the sacred, it has been, as with many of my colleagues, I fear, um, largely Christian music. Mm-hmm. And so it was very interesting last year to have when when one of the students in my choir realized that there would not be any Hanukkah music on the what we call a holiday concert. Yeah. Whereas we had performed some the year the years leading up to that, um, mm. she was hurt, and we sat down to talk mm. about it. And I said, I, I want to hear from you, and uh, but I also want you to know why that was because I remember very clearly hearing a lecture from a very um, eminent Jewish choral music source saying the one thing you don't want to do is have a token Hanukkah piece on what else is a Christmas concert. Right. And yet, and this student appreciated mm-hmm. that and heard that and said, but I don't see myself in this concert. Yeah. I don't see myself in this concert. Mm-hmm. And to hear it put in that language, which, and it's language I've heard before, mm. um, but to hear it put from this student's mouth, a student that I greatly respect, um, that was eye-opening to me and it it made her and i learned afterwards many people in the audience much more grateful for the fact that we had acknowledged hanukkah even though hanukkah is a minor holiday in in the jewish tradition versus christmas in the christian tradition it still was important it still spoke to them and it and it did a little bit of what you're talking about normalizing and so that was a powerful learning f- moment for me nearly 30 years into my career. So we're, we're always learning and always being reminded of ways in which we can up our game. And that's, that's one that I've been, wow. been conscious of. That's amazing. Well, I, gosh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about this all weekend now. <laughs> um, we, we have to talk again. Yeah, I'd love um, it. I'd love I want it. to respect your time. Um, I'm so grateful to have you, you here. Um, but we should bring this to a close, but my goodness, I have so much, so many questions. Um, 
So is there anything as we wrap up that um, you would say to even a colleague of yours that may be either resistant to uh, some of the things we've been talking about or fearful um, of exploring these things? What, what would you say to that colleague of yours mm. um, that might be feeling those things? That's a great question. I think I would, well, I might start by asking them how music make them, makes them feel when they're at their, when they're feeling at their best mm. and how, uh, and, and what, it, what it means to feel at home in your own skin when you're up there singing or conducting or playing your instrument. What does that feel like? And then to say, <laughs> let's say, is it possible that there are people out there who, who, to whom we're denying that feeling mm. because of what we program. I mean, what okay. you described in your own experience, and I, I know for a fact that you took to the classical repertoire in your solo voice and, and nailed it, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it was also, it, like you said, it was a shock to the system. And I could imagine uh, other people not uh, struggling with it and saying, this isn't for me. I, this doesn't feel natural to me. This doesn't feel right to me. And if we didn't have a place for that person, that mm. might be a problem. Mm. Um, these, I, I work with fantastic colleagues who are creative and thoughtful people. And we, are, we all believe in this. We all have this shared goal of making everyone feel welcome. And I think it's a question of, um, finding ways to take a step back and say, what do we value in this mm -hmm. process? What are we looking for from, from a student who graduates from our program? Mm -hmm. And if we can just uh, um, invite a few more people to that party in, in terms of what the, <laughs> I hate to use the word finished product of a student, mm -hmm. but uh, say now I think many of my colleagues recognize that the field is evolving and that to graduate with a, with a degree and the only thing you do is opera, that might not do it. That might not do it over the long haul. You're probably going to need to be able to sing some musical theater or some gospel or some something else. Yeah. There is slow recognition of that. And I think that we'll start to see the curriculum change. Yeah. Either that or I, I just say, snap out of it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think one right. of those two approaches. Yeah, like you're not going to die. You'll be fine. That's you know? right. Yeah. The, re the reason it's hard for people is it's sort of what you talked about with normalizing. They feel wow. themselves as if what they knew and learned and loved is under attack right. instead of the, uh, yes and instead of no but. It, yes. It's, it's never either or, but right. in our culture right now in 2020, the, the way we're communicating with each other, at least through media and social media, is trying to make us very binary in how we think, but that's not how we're designed. That's the, right. the human mind is not designed to just be either or. It is designed to hold complex ideas all at the same time. Some of them, you know, warring against each other and still be okay. Yeah. Um, and still move forward. So, man, that is just fantastic. Um, God, you are just one of the most brilliant people I know. And again, blowing my mind. Um, so just as we wrap up here, uh, I just want to again honor and bless you <laughs> as a person and uh, for your work that is so important and so needed in the world. Um, and you know, you may not have people in your world that constantly tell you this like I do, because that's just part of who I am. <laughs> However, I can guarantee that. Um, man, your, your life is just impacting every single person that you come in contact with. And so um, I just want to honor you and thank you for that and encourage you uh, just to keep at it every day. Keep being yourself. <laughs> uh, keep doing the good work. And um, man, I love, I love thinking about even your vision for uh, training and college and that whole experience through creative people. Um, I like thinking about that future a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Paul, for today. 
Thank you, Nikki. I'm, I'm so, I feel so blessed to have had you in my life for this long and to have you stay, uh, and, and this is a word I learned from you, to be intentional. And you are intentional in how you stay in contact with me and that has enriched uh, what I do. And uh, thank you for having me on. Thanks to your listeners for, for uh, but they know what's up. They know who you are. They, they tune in for a reason. That's right. Thank you.